Hi, I'm Agabayer. Hi, I'm Shani Person. Welcome to The Deep Dive, a monthly culture lab podcast where we dive headfirst into a topic that is crucial for building thriving cultures at scale. Join us as we geek out and explore the intricacies of culture, discussing everything from the latest trends to timeless philosophies. With each episode, we take a deep dive into a specific area, offering unique perspectives and insights on how to create and sustain a culture that fosters growth, innovation, and success. Whether you are a business leader, HR professional, or just someone interested in understanding how cultures work, the Culture Labs Deep Dive is the show for you. So sit back, relax, and get ready to take the plunge into the fascinating world of culture with us. And today, we're going to talk about fun at work. I will share the conversation we had with Shani in a moment, but first I want to tell you about the Cultural Brand community. It's a place where people people connect with exceptional peers and learn from world-class experts, some of them the guests of this show. It's also where they get all the support they need to cultivate a culture where their team members can do their best work. We have a private member platform, toolkits, resources, and an amazing video library. And we make constant additions and improvements based on the question that is really the center of our work. How can we best support the people who work on company culture? If you are curious to learn more, go to tinyurl.com forward slash culture And now, with no further ado, here is Shani and I riffing on the topic of the month, fun at work. Shani, welcome to the deep dive. Thank you. Yet another one. Yet another one. I'm really looking forward to this one. We had a full start. We arranged to record this episode already once we met, and then we decided we don't really feel like talking about fun. (laughs) There's a lot of stuff happening in the world that doesn't seem very enjoyable or fun. And I think we were both feeling the weight of the world on our shoulders, both in our personal lives and generally. And so we thought, well, maybe we should just have a chat and postpone it. But today we are ready, aren't we? Yeah, I think we're ready. And I'm glad we waited because I think we're we're going to uh, have more fun talking about it today as well. Yeah, this is a theme. The theme is fun at work. And it, it's a really interesting one because I get a lot of pushback when I talk about it with organizations or leaders. And I'm really keen to get your perspective on that and what sort of reactions do you get from various people that you work with. But even before we go there, just in terms of building the context for our conversation, I want to ask you a question that I asked more than 3,000 people now. Are you cool with that? I'm always up for a question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Tell me about a time you did your best work. What was it like? What conditions did you have in place that made it possible? First of all, I love that question. And I know we've we've spoken about it before. I have a foot in in every camp when it comes to this question, because it is either a moment where I get to really dig into a question or a topic that really interests me and lose myself in it a little and just be with my thoughts and and go after all these threads that you're finding just go into the rabbit holes right and just sit in those and go hmm, okay what's going to happen here and where is this thought going to lead next and how can i build on these things so one piece is that and the other is of course with others and in moments where there's a sense of people being tapped into each other, listening, not necessarily agreeing, but just there's an openness and sharing. There's some kind of shared desire to move towards something common. People are 
being open with their thoughts and ideas. And there's this ability to build on one another and come up with the next good thought. And what if this and somebody dares to throw in a new angle and you kind of go off on a tangent and, and go find something else. So I think the theme is the same across both. And I quite enjoy doing it both with other people and also on my own. But there's, a, for me, a theme of exploration and curiosity that is very much attached to my sense of fun with work, at least. So here's my observation. When you talk about this, like your entire demeanor changes and <laughs> you literally light up, like you smile, your eyes sparkle. And this is very interesting because it has been happening all this time, as I was speaking to people about this question, every single person immediately lights up when they get to talk about these moments. And that really showed me that work is a really important part of our lives when we can do our best work. And it's a deep, deep human need. And what's really interesting is that there is this very, very strong element of fun there. But no one really talks about, you know, there was a time when I did my best work and what made it possible was the fact that we had the ping pong table, you know, and I was able to just play some ping pong with my buddies or we had beer on tap or Friday pizza parties. No, people talk about stuff like you did. I had the mental space and the time to really dig deep into a problem that was interesting to me and explore it. You use this word exploration. And it was challenging, but at the same time, I felt confident that I have the resources and the capabilities to tackle it. And there was this moment where you get the space to look at it and think about it and, and tweak some things on your own, which is closely linked to flow and what Mihail talked about. But it's also really about our need to solve interesting problems and make progress in a certain direction. So it's interesting because almost everyone talks to me about these moments when they are on their own, irrespective of where they sit on the spectrum of introvert versus extrovert. So extroverts need some alone time as well, and introverts too. But then what's also interesting is that to have fun at work, we need these meaningful connections with others. And these moments, as you say, where you really get to bounce off ideas and, and test your ideas and build on each other's ideas. And there is a sense of co-creation and playfulness and no one really takes themselves too seriously. It feels like you have this psychologically safe environment. And what I find striking in these conversations is that there are so many common themes. And through this process, I have identified three pillars of thriving cultures, fun, meaning, and belonging. And I want us to dive into what I learned about fun. Happy to share, of course, what I've identified around fun and how we misunderstand it and what it seems to mean to the people that I have spoken to. But I'm also super curious what your perspective on it is, how important it is at work. How can we cultivate an environment where people can have that sort of fun? I call it deep fun because it's not like, you know, the shallow fun of binge watching a Netflix series or having a beer with someone. It's deeply fulfilling. And I think the difference between deep and shallow fan is that when you engage in activities of shallow fan, at the end, you feel a bit blah, like, you know, it was too much. I feel like actually I'm more drained than energized. I can watch a Netflix series for four hours. Do I feel more alive after that? Probably no, <laughs> but I did have experiences of collaborating with others or even on my own, you know, working on an interesting project for four hours and I was energized and I did feel more alive. And I think that's the key difference between what deep fun is and what shallow fun is. Anyhow, where should we take this conversation? What are the questions that emerge for you right now? I mean, I'm obviously curious to dive a little bit deeper into your research because I know you you have within the framework of fun also defined a little bit more what that is. So I would love to double click on that as a starting point. Okay, so I'll be brief. And if there's anything that you want me to unpack, I'm happy to. 
So here's the thing. When I identified these pillars, what I also started saying that people need things at an individual level. And it's really, do I have the conditions that I need? But they also need something at the interpersonal level, which is, you know, how do I work with others? And then there is also something around the wider organization, whether it's a wider team or even the entire organization. So I sometimes call it the company level. And when it comes to fun, at the individual level, the way people talk about this is very similar, actually, to what you have just shared. So people talk about having interesting problems to solve. This is really a source of fun for a lot of people. So being challenged, but there is this Goldilocks zone there that people mention where you are challenged enough. It's not feeling comfortable, but you are not in your panic zone either. So you know that if you try, you know, you're probably going to be able to make meaningful progress in the right direction on this. When we enter the panic zone or the overwhelm zone, it doesn't feel like fun anymore. It feels too much. It feels overwhelming. So the Goldilocks thing is really important. And in order to be able to be there, we need autonomy. That's super important. People need their abilities to be stretched. They need resources and support. And something incredibly important that we hugely underestimate, individuals need the space, both the headspace, but also time to be able to get themselves in that zone. And the way we have set up our organizations is not really helpful because we really live in the time confetti uh, zones so most of the time. Like we now learned that it's better to schedule a 45 minute meeting. And so when we approach 45 minutes, everyone's like, yeah, I have a hard stop. I need to go. And irrespective of where you are in the conversation, it's like, okay, that's it. Uh, we need to now go to the next meeting. And it feels like there's never enough breathing space for exploration, ideas, deeper approaches that are going to generate disruptive thinking or innovative solutions. I talk to a lot of people who say it's so frustrating because I basically start my real job after 5 p.m. when the meetings are over. So <laughs> yeah, fun at work. It's really not about the stuff that we think about, not being bean bags. Individuals really need what, what I have just mentioned. So this is at the individual level. Interpersonal level, it's this sense that I'm with a group of people or even with one person where we get to have this playful approach to solving problems where none of us takes ourselves too seriously, where we are open to each other's ideas, where we see and hear each other. This is incredibly important. And where we hear and see each other's ideas as well and improve and develop them together. This feels like a dance to people. People very often talk to me about playing music together feels like that kind of collaboration or playing sports together on a team. This is that vibe where you are almost one and ego is certainly not actively involved in that process. It's one of those moments like you can have you know, a group of people working on a problem, but if there is too much ego, fun goes out of the window. And then the third element, which is more around really the personality of the team or of the organization, the shared way of doing things that is relatively consistent across the board is people talk a lot about levity and humor and having that space where, you know, even if you are really stressed, you talk to someone or you get out into the corridor and someone will make you laugh or will do something goofy. 
And you simply can't, you know, you can't stay tense. You can't stay stressed. They're going to diffuse this. And we know from science that this is incredibly important because, uh, of course, when we are stressed, we're in this fight or flight space where our neocortex is frozen. We can't use it. So basically, it's impossible to be creative. It's impossible to be disruptive. It's impossible to innovate when, when we are stressed. So these are the three things that I've identified individually. Are we stretched and supported uh, to do our best work? Interpersonally, do we have an environment where we can co-create and collaborate in a way where ego is checked in at the door and we really see each other? And at a wider level, do we have this culture of levity and humor that allows us to engage with others in a playful way? I like that. It's really interesting. What resonated with me or everything resonated with me, but some things that came up as I was listening to you was our relationship with risk. And what I heard also when you were talking about this mode of exploration and modes of interaction is that when we can reduce the sense of risk with the benefit of exploration instead, then it is more fun because risk, as you say, it just puts us in this triggering state. It, it triggers our adrenaline. It puts our brain in a state where we're much more limited. It just made me also curious about how we set ourselves up to reduce some of the sense of risk or danger in terms of the work that we're doing. And that will, of course, vary depending on the different types of work that you do. But a lot of us who do office work actually manufacture the sense of risk or urgency. And we can do a lot to just kind of dim it down and, and be more in that state of playfulness almost, uh, which is a taboo word. I know, again, in corporate, we're not supposed to say we were playful, but but I think it is attached to fun a little bit. Yeah, fun is a very triggering word in itself in the corporate environment. And I'm happy to talk about that later. But I'm so glad, Shani, that you've brought up this idea of risk, because actually, and this this was fascinating to me as I have spoken to people, I think that we are able to withstand the sense of something being very risky more than we think we are if we have the right interpersonal connections within the team and if we know that people have our back. And frankly, when people really describe situations, very specific situations where they did their best work, the majority of them, I would say, probably 80% of specific situations were situations where the stakes were actually very high. So like failure, you know, would have a significant cost and whatever we were doing had some risk to it. And I think this is where this Goldilocks zone comes into play because we want something to be challenging and risky, actually, to be excited about it. Like, you know, when something is routine and the outcome can be predicted, there is no sense of fun. We get bored. So risk is an integral part of fun. But, you know, this is something that Simon Sinek said to me when I interviewed him. He said, courage is interpersonal and contextual. No one jumps out of an airplane because they have courage. They jump out of an airplane because they have a parachute on their back. And in a team context, you know, we have courage and we enjoy working on risky things because we know that our teammates have our back. If someone works on their own on a project, it's much harder. But then, of course, they can have a different kind of a parachute. Maybe they um, feel very confident about their skills in a certain area or have advisors or whatever it is that serves this purpose of, of a parachute. But actually, there is no fun without risk. This is a very interesting finding that I've had through these interviews. Not a single person told me, oh, you know, it was really fun when I was doing my expenses every month. <laughs> I was looking forward to the day of expenses and like scanning the receipts and submitting them to accounting. That was the most fun that I had at work. Yeah, just we, you know, we like doing difficult things. That's the funny thing. And that's where the 
irony is because I hear a lot of leaders saying, you know, my people are complacent, they are not willing to take risks and blah, blah, blah. I disagree. I think that people love working on risky, challenging work, provided that they have the parachute. And that's where the real conversation begins. How can we create an environment where people, you know, jump out of the airplane, not because they're crazy or want to commit suicide, but because they know that they have the right support system to take these risks. What I hear when I listen to you is also that there is a difference between the risk that is, you know, life threatening to us, which we often associate with risk of being something really big versus the risk that is more in the sense of unpredictability or opportunity or something that isn't, you know, going to immediately frame and limit you into this little box. And this is anything you can do. You can only do your expenses in here. And I like that nuance, I think, because yeah, I, I hear that. There needs to be some something to be curious about. There needs to be something to be curious about. Also, human beings are really meaning-making machines, and we love narratives and stories. And the oldest story of humankind is the story of a hero on a journey of self-improvement and or discovery and exploration. And there is always a challenge. So the hero wants something and there is a risk in getting it. And, you know, they need to fight the dragons, et cetera, et cetera. And I think very often, even in organizational context, I had this conversation literally before we started recording with one of my team members. And it was a very existential conversation about a very existential risk that we need to take as an organization which is basically deciding what we're going to prioritize and where we are going to put our efforts and what we are going to stop doing. And there is this very safe part of our business that brings a lot of revenue and it's our security blanket. And we keep doing it and it keeps us busy and we don't invest enough time in the new business that we want to build. And we said, well, you know, we really need to take the leap and the risk and stop doing the stuff that is paying well to build the stuff that we want to build to create the impact that we want to, to create. And so I think even in the business context, we do sometimes have conversations where it almost feels like life and death, not literally, obviously. But, you know, you know that your company can go bust. You are taking this risk and you are having this conversation with your team and you will never be able to take the leap if you don't believe that you have a team strong enough to support you in taking that risk. So it's a very real thing. And, you know, once you know that you have that security net, then it becomes fun. Otherwise, it's just terrifying. I'm still left for this like nuance of risk. But also, I think, just reminds me what you're saying about this deeply existential thing is the ability to meet each other in the ups and downs of what it is to be human and to laugh in the moments where you're feeling really pressured is to actually connect on a level that isn't necessarily about work or just like a little bit beyond what is the task that we have at hand. Because I also think that that's meaningful to us as humans when we feel like there's another person on the other side of this table or screen or wherever it is that we're sitting and we somehow meet and impact each other in whatever big or small way that definitely contributes as well to that sense of fun I think. Oh 100 percent that's that interpersonal part and Literally, I, I haven't heard a single story of the time people did their best work where others wouldn't be involved and that deep, meaningful connections with others that, as you say, is not just around the task, by the way, but it's human connection first, content later. And so problem solving comes after we can trust each other. And it, again, goes back to, to that parachute thing, right? Do I have the people here that I trust as human beings? Are we connected enough? to do something risky together. And trust, of course, operates on many different levels, but 
you can trust someone to do a task relatively well, and it might be one person that that you do have that trust, but you might not necessarily trust them to babysit your kids, for example, right? <laughs> But the highest form of trust you can have with the people that you work, this is what I found through the research, the more the work benefits. So the funny thing is that if you can trust your team members, even with personal stuff like keeping a secret or, you know, whatever it is, the more powerful the parachute becomes and therefore people can have fun with really, really difficult stuff because they can rely on each other. You know, I've had a few different conversations on this topic recently with relation to trust. And I think there are like three words that stand out to me. One is trust and it's maybe the intrapersonal piece, but another one is the safety. And that's maybe just this kind of reliance on the fact that we can do things together. And the third one that actually has come up and I find really interesting, and I don't necessarily have conclusions on this, is faith, which is another level which is sometimes just in facing the unknown, which we do and which we want to, is there is quite often a part of jumping in and exploring that is about faith, that whatever exists between us is enough. And we don't necessarily know what it is and we don't know who it's going to come from, but we can have faith (laughs) that it's going to work out And it's not something necessarily that you even earn or that you can create. You have to have it quite simply, just leap into it. Yeah, I love this. It kind of reminds me of my conversation with Rachel Botsman, who's one of the leading authorities, I think, in trust. And I think I'm going to butcher it a little bit, but her definition of trust is the relationship that we have with the unknown. And this is exactly what you're talking about, right? And it's also the thing, that unknown thing that we all need to feel at work. And I almost think like there is almost a spiritual element to it. We can't really put our finger on it, right? But there's something that, and when we can tap into it, it's this source of trust, it's the source of creativity. It's something we haven't learned to describe But it's a little bit like beauty, you know, people say it's hard to describe beauty, but but you know it when you see it. And I think that thing that you say, that unknown, again, when we feel it, when we experience it, I think everyone knows that that's the thing, that's the source of fun and creativity and trust and human connections, but it's hard to describe it. What do you think it consists of? Like, do you have a theory on that? What what the thing is, and 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 also how do you how do you define fun yourself at work? Oh my god, I don't know how I define it. It's for me, it's like it's a it's a feeling more than necessarily something. It's something that you tap into. I always feel like you know the words that you're saying, art, connection. They're a little bit beyond the concrete. Fun is the same. It's relational. It's uh, individual as well. It's uh, situational. I think just to, to loop back to what we said, we didn't feel like we were in a mindset to record this the first time. To me, it's just also that, you know, that fun is in relation to other things. <laughs> I, I think I have like personal beef for this word because I was never the funny person. I'm I'm a person who has ease of laughter. And in my family, they would always make fun of me because I would laugh even if I was sat by myself in front of the TV, I would always laugh out loud. <laughs> <laughs> and I know my mom would always go, what, what's this thing? Like? You're weird. She always kept thinking it's strange that even if I'm alone, I will laugh out loud. So I don't know. For me, it's it's also energy. Of course, there are situations that can help us access it. It's a lot of emotion for me. And then it depends. I think you can also build towards fun together with other people because it's it's something that you also kind of construct together, right? You share experiences, you share moments, and then certain memories become fun or funny or situations become funny that aren't to anybody else. So I think there's a lot for me in this, just the building of it, which 
yeah, it's really beautiful. And I'm always curious about that. When does it become accessible to us? And sometimes it isn't. Sometimes we are in that mindset where we just even look at the thing that made us laugh yesterday and we go, no, today is not getting me there. (laughs) Entirely. I think what I'm hearing also in your answer is because it's energy and it ebbs and flows, it cannot entirely be forced, right? And we also need to create space for other energy that's equally important in life but in the workplace as well. And I completely agree too that I don't think that you can build a sense of fun in the workplace forcing it. But what you can probably do is create an environment and maybe some, I don't know, a framework that can help fun emerge more naturally. Whereas in a different environment, it wouldn't because it would be too constraining. And this is a really interesting conversation for me because we know, I think, from personal experiences in life that there are certain friends, for example, right, in our circle of friends that bring in this energy that just makes us feel more alive. And we are more open and more willing to be playful with them and maybe even, you know, be silly and do silly things. Like today, this morning, we had an event in the culture brand community with Michael Dixon, who's an amazing person. He's a musician and he does a lot of work around creativity with organizations. I am not a person who would sing and dance on a Zoom call ever. And he was actually able to make me dance without asking me to dance, by the way, on a Zoom call this morning at 9 (laughs) a.m. So I think there are people who can create that environment where we feel more comfortable to be goofy, to be silly, to be creative, to take a risk and say something that we don't know is the right answer necessarily. What are your thoughts on that? What can we do? And you know, how does that work? What are the mechanics and dynamics of that? You know, the first thing and what I was thinking about as you were sharing this and, and to go back to the beginning, what you were saying is there's something about fun being authentic And it can only be authentic if A, it's not forced and B, there is also space for things that are in contrast with fun. So I also think that, you know, fun becomes more of a thing if you also feel that you can show up if you're really sad or if you're having a really shit day. Yeah. And that is also okay. And that it's kind of, I always find that conversations and feelings, they have like an arc. And, you know, it's like with any drama or any play or anything that plays out, there's an arc to it. And I think it's also allowing for those things to be okay. And it's built on contrasts, as you're saying. Yeah. So I do think that there is power in the contrasting existing as well, because if if there's only space for fun, then it's kind of glued on and it's not, it isn't felt anymore. It's kind of inauthentic. It's forced. So I do think that part of it is that is is leaving space for more things to exist. Amen. Shani, preach. (laughs) I I really couldn't agree more. This is so incredibly important. How do we do that? Or, you know, how do you think about creating the space for different things? I don't have any absolute answers to this. I think this is an exploration within every context, obviously. (laughs) I will always answer it depends. This is a terrible, terrible thing to do. But I've had a longstanding principle of always meeting the human first. And I do think that there is something to that, that we're not in any way stigmatizing anything that we come with as humans whether it be the fun and the goofy and the amazing and like playful and creative, because we stigmatize that too. And equally, we stigmatize the things that have us go, this is really hard right now. So either we're going like tone yourself down or no, it's like switch up your energy, leave that at home. So I do think one is that, and I think we've come back to this a lot in, in the episodes that we record. It's a parallel thing of both fostering this ability in ourselves to harbor our own feelings and harbor the feelings of, or not harbor necessarily, but meet the feelings of others and hold that space. 
And then looking at what is the context around us look like? What are the expectations that we're piling on to people? How are we caring for them in different types of moments? How are we scheduling our meetings? It came back again, you were saying meeting confetti. And I know I recorded an episode for my own podcast with uh, head of design at Tieto. Uh, his name is Andre, Andre Fanguero. And we talked about this exactly how he said a lot of fun and creation and exploration, you can't fit it in your 45 minutes. Exactly. It's yeah. a process. You have to like leave a little bit of space. You can't exactly like in the middle of sometimes the arc. And I think for me, that comes back to that. Sometimes when you leave, you're like only halfway up the arc and you're thinking, this is hopeless. What? <laughs> Nothing's going to happen here. But actually, you're just like 10 minutes away from blowing a door open that you didn't know. So for me, I think both the fun and accessing those feelings is also about learning to be with the arc of whatever is going on and actually accepting and creating space for process to exist because then you have also space to have fun i think when you're feeling too much constraint and you're feeling too much stress and expectations you're definitely kind of pushing yourself a little bit too hard and okay no we don't have time to laugh now we we have to fix this or whatever uh so i i think it, that was the third word that came up when you were talking before is also time things have to be allowed to take time. I mean, sometimes it happens miraculously that we'll work something out in a minute, but for the most part, things are a process. And I think, so for me, it's this mix of things like the emotional space, but also the time and space to explore things and be allowed to be in in curiosity a little bit more. Uh, because I, I do think that the time constraints force us to act on more assumption and cuts off a lot of the kind of positive and fun sentiment that we might have because we don't have time for this now. We were 45 minutes. We don't have time to check in and see, Aga, how are you doing today? And Shani, how are you doing? Because we only have 45 minutes to solve whatever problem it is. On a very basic level for me, it is that sometimes doing exactly what we did last time, we tried to record and just go, you know what? This is not going to happen today. Today, we need this. <laughs> exactly. And I want to, you know, I want to really applaud you for that because you really, I think, held the space for both of us to show up in that conversation genuinely and, and what you have mentioned about first the human connection, which, which you always do when we connect. And the things that emerged in our conversation were difficult for both of us. And well, I was the one who said, I don't see a conversation about fun happening, but you were the one who kind of really gave us the permission because you said, no, definitely not. <laughs> a conversation <laughs> about fun is not going to happen today. And I think actually we were really well served doing that and postponing because it's palpable to me that we have a completely different energy today. And yeah. we're in a much better <laughs> mindset to talk about fun at work. And so, and you know, you are a busy person and you are someone who had to sacrifice something to reschedule it and to rearrange things. And I think this was such a beautiful way of role modeling what it can look like. You know, we will get to this final outcome of getting a show out there on fun, but giving it the space and the time and being really mindful of what's happening is important. And it kind of makes me think about this concept of toxic positivity. I see it a lot in so many organizations and it really doesn't allow people this space to really engage with what's happening for them and, and what they need to process. And there's also this fear that if you are not immediately enthusiastic about everything, you will be deemed as this negative person, right? The party pooper uh, <laughs> who just doesn't know how to have fun. And so I wonder if you have any thoughts on this. What are your observations when, when it comes to toxic positivity in organizations and how can we fight it in a way that is actually effective without you know, jeopardizing our careers or reputations? Because obviously no one wants to be perceived as, oh, she's this negative, you know, uh, devil's advocate or black hat person, never something positive to bring to the conversation, blah, blah, blah. 
That's an interesting question. The first thing that comes up for me is so many things about what we bring to the table are contextual. And sometimes we might be well served to think about, depending on what we're trying to do and solve, the frameworks that are helping us do it. Because, so I'll try to explain how I'm thinking about this. Sometimes, and we will all have experienced this, we go into a certain context and we can't be who we are, really. Like, everyone else is toxically positive, so I have to be toxically negative because somebody has to balance it out. I think we all try in our different ways to always like balance out different situations as we step into spaces. And so I do think that sometimes it's in our facilitation of moments that we actually have an opportunity to create frameworks or clearer roles in how we're kind of playing out the dynamic that would allow more of our different types of sentiment and different types of capability to come into play rather than it becoming something personal. If you look at self-led organizations and a lot of thinking behind that, there are certain ways, like for, for many things, there aren't necessarily like here's here's what the hierarchy looks like, but for decision-making, this is exactly how we always do it. And there are these roles and there's this routine and it allows each of us to play the role of ourselves and not fill this gap of whatever is going on. So I think one piece is, can be that, is to actually play with certain situations where we feel like this is occurring a lot and see how we can make it possible for people to bring more of themselves into it. But then I think the other thing that I think about, and which I know I, I thought about as we were going into this, is also that, ironically, we stigmatize anything that isn't like quite neutral. We stigmatize too much fun. We also stigmatize being too serious, too negative, too... There's so much stigma attached to emotions that aren't in this kind of manageable frame <laughs> and i don't know exactly why um beige we just want everything beige. yeah <laughs> we want everything to be beige and i wonder if it is as simple as sometimes just it's not supposed to be beige it gets to <laughs> yeah. be really shit and it gets to be really good and when it does then when you feel like you can come with more of your nuance then maybe you don't have to be I tend to feel like toxic positivity is like a little bit of protection. It's like a little bit of survival. It's taking something a bit over the top. If you're actually allowed to, again, for me, it's coming back to the nuance. If you're allowed to have nuance, then maybe you don't have to be on that end of the spectrum. 100%. And I think that actually toxic positivity comes with lack of psychological safety very often, right? Where you have armies of yes men who basically always agree with whatever the boss says because there's simply no safety to speak up and 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 speak the truth right so there's a lot of bs on top of bs and usually people are very smart so they can actually bs each other very eloquently <laughs> about stuff without never addressing the real issues and there's a whole conversation, whole different conversation happening on WhatsApp after the meeting or even during the meeting on WhatsApp between people. But on the surface, everyone's, yes, absolutely wonderful. What a great idea. How exciting. We can't wait. And this is where the word toxic comes up for me, because if this is happening, it's such a recipe for disaster. And if you don't allow a little bit of color, let's put it like this, in these conversations. And if everything seems so incredibly harmonious, then I think you have something to worry about. Because real life and real people is peaks and valleys, as you say, and all sorts of colors. If you only get beige at like this constant level line, someone's not being very honest. Someone's not having the space to, to, to express what they're really thinking and feeling. Yeah, I think it's weird because that, that's the biggest thing that I'm, I'm sitting with inside now with our conversation is how much overall authenticity plays a role in, the, in that sense of deep fun that you were talking about in the beginning, which isn't 
of course, we can talk about how you can design an amusement park. And that's definitely a way to manufacture fun and experiences that make your stomach tickle and like fill your eyes with sparkle. But work for the most part, isn't that? Yeah. Yeah. That's a shallow fun, but the deep fun, you cannot, yeah, you cannot manufacture it this way. No. Okay. So I'm mindful of the fact that we're slowly drawing to the end of our conversation. And I wonder if we have the space and maybe something to share with our listeners around what would be a few actions that we can take as individuals for our team members or maybe guiding leaders in our organizations to create the right conditions for deep fun to happen and be a constant in your culture, not in the sense that it's always there, but in the sense that it reappears on a regular basis, because I think this is a realistic goal to have. Not that people will be experiencing fun 100% of the time, but that it will be a regular occurrence, right, in the work lives, where you have these moments when things are flowing and you can really create beautiful things together and get a sense of pride and, and laugh along the way and have a great time together. Do you want to start with some thoughts around what are some practical things we can do to create these conditions? What we've spoken about is daring to hold space for what is there. And I do think that on an individual basis, even if you're like me, who is not the person who's going to make all the jokes and make everyone laugh, you can still do something to hold space for that to be able to exist. And I think it is that being open to whatever is there. And sometimes it is the fun, but sometimes it is the, the hard moment before the fun. Like holding those moments without any judgment and with the faith, actually, that it's that arc we're going to, this is something we're moving through right now. And it's okay. This gets to take up space, it gets to be here. And it is the most important thing we can do right now, if this is what is felt or needed. And that's not to say you shouldn't have goals or anything like that, because I've gotten those objections as well. Yeah, but we still, yeah. And I have a very profound belief that, you know, when we actually give ourselves space to move through those moments, with humanity and humility, then after the things are going to work out, because then we actually have the emotional space to take care of whatever it is that's coming our way, which we don't have necessarily in, in a negative moment, for example. So I actually think that is practicing that, holding space for whatever is there. And equally, when you get to the fun part of the spectrum, don't shut it down. Like be in that too, be in that exploration, be in that fun. Don't be in judgment of it. You don't know where it's going to lead. That's maybe when your crazy innovative idea is going to come up because people are actually like relaxed and in explorative. So yeah, I think that is maybe one of the principal things that, that I'm left with. Yeah. I think building on what you have just said, Shani, I think it requires us to have trust in the process, right? So we need to be focused more on the how, not the what, because actually the final outcomes are not entirely within our control. You know, you can do your best to win that client project or whatever it is that people are working on, um, but it doesn't really guarantee that you are going to get the project. And it's true for so many things. So trusting the process of allowing things to emerge as they need to emerge, I, I think is, is incredibly important here. Okay, so let me think what would be my addition to this. I think going back to what I learned chatting with people about the time they did their best work, we need to know what lights people up at work. And sometimes we don't even know it about ourselves. So back to holding the space, I think another thing that we absolutely need to hold the space for is reflection around where does joy come for me at work? Like what are the things that really, really, really energize me? 
When do I feel alive at work? And holding the space, to me, it means asking this question of our team members regularly and then really shutting up and listening without guiding them, you know, without implying what the right answer would be. Because very often we kind of fit people into certain roles and there is an implicit ex expectation that what would light them up would be accounting because they are accountants, <laughs> <laughs> right? And the reality of human nature is that sometimes things that light us up are not fitting entirely the job that we are doing. And I think smart organizations, smart leaders see an opportunity there. And there are plenty of examples. One of the best known to me personally is PropellerNet and Nikki Gattenby, who back at that time was the managing director. It's a digital agency in the UK. Nikki wrote a book called Super Engaged, and she talked about how they've enabled employee dreams to come true and how as a result of that they created new businesses and and people you know switched roles and how it helped them grow the business which is kind of mind blowing because when you think about you know we have this specific strategy to dominate this space and suddenly someone talks to you about organizing safaris in Africa you're like this really doesn't connect at all and they found a beautiful way to capture people's passion and channeling it in such a way that that it actually added to their bottom line. But I think most importantly to what their organization became and how it grew and the impact that they could have and also, you know, how people felt about, about working there. So yeah, long-winded way of saying hold the space to help people identify what lights them up, what work they love doing, and be open enough to hear and then perhaps create opportunities for them to do more of what they love and less of what doesn't light them up. And one, just one disclaimer here that is in incredibly important. Sometimes people will be good at doing something, but they don't enjoy it. Sometimes people struggle with something, but they still enjoy doing it. Like for me, for example, I hated public speaking and I still do in a way, but I also enjoy it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's that paradox. And if you ask me what lights me up, I wouldn't necessarily say public speaking, but I would say sharing ideas and helping people identify new, better ways of solving problems. And that's one of the avenues. So it's a nuanced conversation to be had with people because sometimes they might hate something, but at the same time, they might love it because of what it's doing for them. I love that. And I really love this exploration of what, what sparks joy for you, period. I know that before I, I embarked on, on running my own business, I ran a team and uh, we worked with learning, and one of the things I tried to do within within the constraints and the context was to put in a moment per week where we would dedicate time to learning ourselves. I put there, you can learn whatever you want during this time. If you want to bake cakes, do that. Uh, just connect to the joy of learning something. And we often forget and distrust actually how much of the things that we learn or like are transferable into anything that we do. The joy itself is transferable, but also things that, you know, when we do things from that place of, of being curious and joyful and, and finding it fun, then we can actually find learnings and I can find learnings in baking cakes that I can apply to my work for sure. It's just a matter of, again, like you're saying, reflection as well. So yeah, we've kind of baked it in. And I think maybe just to add to that, what you were saying, the process and the knowledge is actually this concept of time. Just to add to this acceptance of process, I also think that there is something to be said about playing with different frames of time when we do things. And that's not to ignore that we can set deadlines and and still be structured about how we work towards things. but. I would just invite also to play with different timeframes and allow for, for a little bit more 
flexibility in that because I do think that there is also a sense of, as you're saying, trust and relaxation. If there's too much pressure, then it's really hard to access the fund. So, and that's not to say I have a formula. It's not this X amount of time. It is whatever amount of time it requires in your context to get to that point of ease and exploration, dare to play with it. Don't necessarily have to listen to all the efficiency experts who say meetings need to look exactly like this or like that. Yeah. This is so, so important. And that's, yeah, that's one of the consistent themes that has come out of the conversations. When we have time and space, then it really makes such a huge difference. So something to, something to reflect on. Speaking of very specific things, companies that started doing things differently to, to create that. So there are getting shit done days where there are no meetings and people are really given an entire day to finish stuff or to work on something creative. I think it's beautiful, even if it's just, if it's, if it's just an hour, it's beautiful. But especially if you have this vast swath of time to fill uh, in any way, by the way, you deem helpful in that moment. And it might be, as you say, just, you know, working on a passion project because it will eventually for sure somehow contribute to something if it's a deep human need that we have. We know that human beings don't really work like machines. So, yeah. <laughs> and we shouldn't. We shouldn't. <laughs> okay. What else, Shani, comes up for you in terms of practical things that people can do to put the right conditions in place? When you said that, the first thing that came to my mind is movement, especially when we talk about corporate context. We're all sat on our butt all day long. And we're all working from our head all day long. There is something to be said about movement, whether it is getting up and going outside and going for a walk or putting a song on and dancing it off for a moment. I do think that there is something to be said about moving our energy beyond this desk and these little squares that we keep looking at and just getting new inflow of that isn't this intellectual input that is something else. I often find that that can also really help involving more senses than just our cognitive mind all the time is also really important. Uh, for the sense of joy and fun, because often we we feel it. We feel it when we have fun. We don't think it, we feel it. So actually, beyond that, just actually feeling our bodies and feeling where we have tensions and feeling where we have joy and, and finding ways of connecting with that, I, I do think that's important. Yeah. There is this wonderful book called Extended Mind, I think is the title. I'll check it to be sure, and we'll post it in the show notes, which talks about the concept of basically what the title says, extended mind. And it's so interesting because there's now science to actually prove that indeed our mind is not just our brain, but it's also our bodies. And as you say, they need to move. But even our environment, we think differently and are capable of different things when we are in nature than when we are in a cubicle or when we can connect to others versus, you know, when we are breathing our own fumes. So to me, in the context of creating the right conditions for fun to take place, it's, as you say, honoring that we're not just a brain in a jar, <laughs> that there is way more to being human. And in order to get to that energy and feeling, as you say, of fun, we need to honor the entire being that makes, makes us human. I love that. I think one thing that I would say to maybe to, to wrap it up is something that I'm not great either. You've mentioned that you are not the one to crack the jokes and, you know, be the person who will make everyone laugh. You are quick to laugh yourself and very sort of open to that and playful. I'm terrible actually at, at telling jokes and um, that's not one of my strengths. I always thought that I should keep away from it because I'm so bad. 
And the interesting thing is that there's research that shows that even an attempt at making a joke, even if it's failed or like a dead kind of joke, really lame, it has a positive impact on others. It makes us uh, be perceived as more uh, approachable, more likable, and watch out for that one, a big surprise, more inspiring as well as a leader, which is kind of mind-blowing to me because I'm thinking, right, you are basically being goofy and how can that have a positive impact on your image as a leader or your impact as a leader? But it seems that actually when people can connect with the, the human side of you, not just the professional, and see the goofiness, it humanizes you. And as a result, it makes you a better leader. So for me, uh, for all the people particularly who feel like, yeah, I'm not great at humor, I really can't make people laugh, reconsider that. And Try, <laughs> try to do something to diffuse the atmosphere from time to time. Tell a joke, even if you are not great at telling jokes, because it does something in terms of creating meaningful human connections between people. Even a failed attempt. That's, that's the beauty of the science. And happy to post a link to that research as well, if people are curious to, to have a look into it. I love that. You know what I, I I observe that I do as compensation? I often tell some story from my life, which is weird or funny or slightly disastrous, but with a humorous twist. Takes the weight off like actually having to be funny and having a punchline, but still like I get this. I think it diffuses, as you said, uh, the relationship. And for me, it just comes back to where we started, which is the need for authenticity to to be in the space in order for fun to exist within it as well. And with that is, you know, our goofiness and our messiness and 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 also our seriousness and uh, whatever it is that we're good at and understanding and all of it, all of it gets to be here. Um, I think, I mean, definitely that is the very blood of the work that I want to do. How can we get to be more human in the spaces where we are, whatever that looks like? So those explorations are always essential. Yeah, so true. And it kind of links really to the other of the pillars that I've discovered, which is that of belonging, because our ability to be authentically ourselves generally in life, but but certainly at work, is so incredibly important to feel like we belong. And of course, belonging, um, most people already know that by now has an impact on how well we are able to perform at work. So these are all connected things and I'm really looking forward to exploring that topic as well. Shani, thank you so much for this conversation thank you, about Anna. fun. And thank you for the other conversation as well and for creating the contrast that we needed in order to be able to step into the fun space from a slightly more difficult space. You know, I got to live that concept of creating space for something, for something else to be able to happen. And thanks again for, you know, embodying it so beautifully. Thank you. I'm Aga Bayer, the creator and host of the Culture Lab podcast. And this is the Culture Lab team. Anis and Labarawi, production manager. Sound producer, Heather McPherson, Twisted Spur Media. I hope that you enjoyed this monthly format where Shani and I discuss all things culture. And if you found this conversation interesting or inspiring or valuable, and chances are that you did since you're still listening here, you'll also love the conversation that I had with Christy Harold. You'll find a link in the show notes. And if you haven't already done so, please go ahead and follow the Culture Lab podcast in your favorite listening app. And if you really want to do me a solid, share it, maybe on social or by text or email, even just with one person, just copy the link and tell your friends who want to find new, better ways of cultivating a great company culture. Tell them to listen and chat about it. Chat about what you've discovered because when shows like this become conversations, 
and conversations become action. That's how we transform the workplace together. And if you want to dive even deeper into the topics, if you want to find like-minded peers who are in charge of culture work in their organization, you might consider joining Culture Brain. It's our one-of-a-kind culture accelerator program and a global community of peers that is truly shaping the future of work. You can learn more about Culture Brain at tinyurl.com forward slash culture brain. Thanks again for tuning in. If you want to get free resources on cultivating a remarkable, powerful, and authentic company culture, especially in a business that scales, type this into your browser, agabayer.com forward slash resources. If you haven't subscribed to the Culture Lab yet, please do it now. That's the best way you can support our work. And finally, we would be ever so grateful if you could rate and review our podcast on the platform that you listen to. Thank you. And you are amazing for listening to this point. Not many people do.